uh, and then what, who, when, how, but most importantly, why? The questions I've been sent by our good listeners for the September 2023, please hold for Dave Sim. And Dodgers, right at the top of the list, right after Fisher. Uh, hey, Manly Matt, and the super famous Canadian Dave Sim. No, I'm definitely more notorious than famous, and I'm definitely not super, super famous. Well, here I am. When, when, when people are listening to this, this is as super famous as I get. Uh, changing artwork, Neil Adams, Barry Windsor Smith, Rick Beach, Dave Sim. All artists change over time. Some, like Bill Sienkiewicz, actively experiment with new media and techniques. Others seem to change gradually. Uh, question, do you think these changes in style are conscious or happen naturally? <laughs> asking, asking for a talentless friend. Uh, both of those happen depending on the artist that you're talking about and uh, depending on what point in the artist's career uh, you're talking about. Um, relating it to the, um, the fast forward end of comic art where when, when you get a comic strip and when you've got a comic strip to do, uh, you hit the ground running, and then um, you can you can do a certain amount of it consciously, and a certain amount of it is just I have to do six strips a week. Um, if I'm doing a Sunday as well, I got to do seven strips a week. Where am I putting my time in? Uh, just grind it out. So if you look at Peanuts, uh, you look at uh, Little Abner, uh, you look at Garfield. Any of those strips, uh, you start off on model. This is, this is what my characters look like. And then fast forward a year, five years, 10 years, and those uh, characters ch have changed considerably and continue to change uh, considerably. If you look at them uh, in, a, in a time lapse sense, you will see that uh, uh, as they go along, uh, they're changing just because of uh, the nature, the nature of the beast. That uh, your unconscious mind and your creative unconscious mind, whatever part of your cartooning comes from your soul and from uh, the core of your personality, as your uh, personality is changing, and as you're making ethical decisions moment by moment by moment in your life, that's that's reflected in your art. So uh, in that sense, when you're asking, does that happen naturally? Yes, it, it's naturally occurring, um, but it only happens naturally in somebody who's doing it uh, 365 days a year for years and, in some cases, decades uh, on end. Uh, now, relating it to the comic book field, um, trying to distill, distill the process as, as much as possible, let's, uh, let's take uh, BWS, Barry Windsor Smith, when he was Barry Smith. Um, obviously, starting out, he wanted to be Jack Kirby in the worst way. <laughs> That's really what he accomplished. He was uh, the worst Jack Kirby clone, uh, but definitely enthusiastic, obviously dedicated, dedicated to uh, having his work look as close as possible to Jack Kirby's work as he possibly could, and if possible, improve on Kirby by exaggerating Kirby, who was already uh, exagger an exaggerated artist. Um, moving from there, I think what happened with uh, uh, Barry was he was being more precise in his pencils to immunize his pencils against bad inking. 
which is not an uncommon thing. I think Jim Starlin did the same thing. The experience of laboring for an entire month on a comic book in pencil, and Marvel doesn't want you to ink, just pencil it, uh, send it to us, we'll get it lettered, and then we'll get uh, the inker to ink it. The next time you're going to see it is when, uh, when it's on the newsstand. And it's like, oh, my God. You know, look what this incompatible inker did to my brilliant pencils. Not to mention, look at how much my pencils have been covered up with, uh, with lettering uh, Roy Thomas's story. Um, so you try, to, you try to minimize that effect by doing more precise pencils. If I, if I really um, put down pencils that virtually um, look like inked drawings, they're that precise, maybe I will be getting better results uh, from the inking stage, which did happen, but not, not to the extent that you wanted it to happen. But what happened with Barry was uh, in being that super precise in his penciling, when he did have the opportunity, Marvel goes, yeah, okay, um, we'll let you ink this one. Um, you will, uh, you pencil it, you send it into us, we'll get it lettered, um, you know, Roy Thomas will write it, and then we'll send it back to you, and you ink it um, in probably bundles of 10 pages. Uh, Red Nails being the, being the classic example. Uh, at that point, it was, I think he intimidated himself because it was, it's one thing to do super tight pencils to immunize yourself against bad inking and have stuff in there where you're going, wow, this is, this is really, really tight and precise. Um, as Gerhardt used to say when he would do his really tight and precise backgrounds, uh, who wants to ink this? Anybody <laughs> want to ink this? And I would sit very quietly at my drawing board. It's like, uh, I probably should have said a couple of times, yeah, okay, give me, give me one of, one of your pencil pages and, uh, I'll, I'll do some of the inking and then you can either do, do what I'm doing or, do what you're doing, and if this just becomes too confusing for you, then don't do that anymore. Don't say who wants to ink this. Uh, and at that point, it was Red Nails became peak Barry Smith, uh, unbeknownst to him, because it was okay, uh, inking, uh, penciling is one thing, inking is another thing, and now that I'm doing both of them, uh, I'm slowing down way, way too much. I had no idea how slow an inker I was, which is why the first half of Red Nails, the end of the story, did get, get gang inked at Marvel, which Barry definitely didn't, didn't want to have happen. But the super precision uh, made for a combination that everybody went, oh, man, this guy, you know, uh, he's got to do Conan from now on, and he's got to do it always like this. And it's like, well, you don't know what you're looking at. You don't know what kind of a torture chamber um, Barry, not Windsor Smith yet, just Barry Smith, uh, put himself into on this one. Better enjoy this, because there's, there's only one red nail. Uh and consequently, when it comes to uh, the market for uh, Barry Smith artwork and Barry Windsor Smith artwork, it all centers on that peak time period. Um, going into it, here's a page where obviously, you know, around uh, Conan Monthly Comic or bi-monthly comic, uh, issue 12, issue 13, around there. Uh, this is where he's getting into that. Here's up through Song of Red Sonia. Uh, and then, you know, 
Barry is pretty much done with this process. This was a major torture chamber, but it's okay. That's if if you if you're buying Barry Smith or Barry Windsor Smith artwork, that's what you want is the stuff in that perceived peak period, which then follows into uh, I quote uh, I wrote it down as quote This is what I pencil and ink like unquote, which was uh, storyteller um, the work that he did on Valiant all the way up through his latest monsters where it's uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to torture myself um, the way I tortured myself on red nails. I have to figure out something where I can ease back on the throttle uh, a little bit. And uh, it's, it's not considered his peak work because that's, it's, that's just not how people perceive Barry Windsor Smith. It's, uh, no, this is, this is stuff that goes for a good buck and it's certainly desirable. But if you ask anybody, uh, you know, I've got a storyteller page where I've got some of this stuff that he did for Valiant or I've got pages for monsters. Uh, would I trade that for a comparable number of pages from Red Nail? Uh, in a New York minute, I would do that. Um, just the way it exists. Relating it to me, I set out to do, uh, Cerebus as ideally I want this to look like it was drawn by Barry Windsor Smith in his Red Nails style, style. And in it is, uh, the Cerebus, um, cartoon character, the funny animal in the world of humans. I want to look like uh, Chuck Jones or Robert McKimson, uh animation cell, which was an example of uh, way too ambitious. For, I, I couldn't even see what those guys were doing, and I was trying to do it. Uh, but <laughs> uh, not Barry Windsor Smith and not Chuck Jones, enthusiastic amateur. Uh, turned out to be peak Dave Sim. It was the the mixture of the enthusiasm um, of of what he was trying to do and really doing it really really badly and really really incompetently communicated to the audience who uh, you know uh, they they they. they look at um, Barry Windsor Smith's art and Chuck Jones or Robert McKinson's art and go, that's really good. I really, really like that. But uh, they don't really know what they're looking at. So consequently, even somebody doing it completely incompetently, it's like, oh, hey, that's cool because that, that looks like BWS. That looks like uh, Chuck Jones. He's doing uh, um, animation riffs on Cerebus instead of uh, um, the basic, uh, you know, Donald Duck, which is what Howard the Duck was. It's like there's there's more facial expressions available if you go over in the direction of Warner Brothers rather than than Disney. Um, so uh, consequently, it's like that's that's where my career came to an end about uh, Cerebus number twenty twenty one. If uh, if you're talking about, um, you know, I own some Dave Sim artwork uh, from 1995. Uh, would I trade that for a page from Cerebus number 10 in a New York minute? Because that's peak Dave Sim, the first, uh, first 20 issues of Cerebus. But as a cartoonist, uh, I was saying as I went along, uh, these are my strengths. This is, this is what I know how to do, or at least suspect how to do. So this is what I'm, I'm leaning in the direction of the storytelling, page composition, uh, where to use the silhouette, uh, transition from panel to panel. Uh, not, it, it's not as commercially viable. It's not my peak work from the uh, point of 
view of the art market, but it it was it is getting better as I'm going. This is what I know how to do. This is what I don't know how to do. So this is what I'm going to uh, going to lean on. This is this is what my work is going to consist of. Uh, combined with this is the best use of Gerhardt's literalist background. Uh, it grounded me because Gerhard draws like Gerhard. It's, uh, you know, you, you tell him, uh, I want you to draw a wall full of bottles in, uh, uh, in a tavern. And he, he will do that. It, it, it's, there, there's, he, he was a complete literalist in that sense. So consequently, that kept me from straying off the reservation too far in the direction of stylization, which I'm very, very fond of. And uh, uh, consequently, from my perspective, Cerebus did get better and better as it went along. Um, for, uh, maybe uh, a falling off in the last part of, uh, or, or parts of the last day, um, that last year was a nightmare, but uh, definitely up through uh, going home, um, form and void, um, latter days, the last day. It was, um, yeah, this is this is the absolute best that I can get. This this is the result of working day in and day out for days or years. And, and decades on end. Which brings me to Dodger's uh, bonus question. Have you looked at the remastered Cerebus art and reassessed your own talent? Uh, no, it, it was it was done. It was, uh, the, the ambition was not to have what happened to Al Foster, where he said uh, the last batch of pages he did of Prince Valiant were lousy. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to be doing this in my 40s uh, because I don't want them uh, to turn out uh, to be lousy. But uh, apart from looking at uh, pages from uh, Rick's story, um, which uh, on, a, on an occasion, I and I was struck looking at them going, uh, this is this is really really good material, um, very very well rendered. Gerard and I were in our unspoken competition about uh, uh, fine fine pen lines. Uh, how fine is too fine? And uh, well, we don't know. We keep going further and further up on uh, on tippy toe. And in terms of this is uh, a caricature of relationships. But it's very, very funny. But um, it's not uh, Marxist, Marxist feminist propaganda. And consequently, it has been dismissed completely out of hand. You don't, you don't even mention Sarah. Um, it's, um, that's, that's the nightmare that Sarah ended up existing in, the Marxist feminist dictatorship. And I think there will come a day of reckoning, but it might take another uh, 50 or 100 years where there will be a whole list of, okay, here's really excellent things that existed between 1970 and whenever the Marxist feminist dictatorship collapsed. And uh, everybody, you know, check these out <laughs> and uh, see if you can support the, uh, the preservation of this material. Because uh, the Marxist feminists don't f around. If it's not Marxist feminism, it needs to be crushed and destroyed. And a lot of the stuff you're going to find, uh, they're going to find 100 years from now. Uh, okay, uh, this got crushed and destroyed. This got crushed and destroyed. And this is this is what they they tried to sell us uh, in uh, in a replacement of it. So. Uh, that's, uh, I wish I could look at it through another lens. It's just, uh, okay, um, Therabus did not, 
did not and will not get in my lifetime a fair hearing just because of the political context that we're in. Uh, I wish it had and regret that uh, that it didn't, and I will never see the day when Cerebus gets the acknowledgement that I think it should get. But that's just the way it works. It's, uh, there are worse things. Nobody asked me to go on the Badan death march. Nobody uh, locked me up in Auschwitz. So there's... Uh, there's suffering in quotation mark in quotation marks, which is all I've ever experienced. And then there's genuine suffering. Well, I'm just thinking I, I do remember when the first phone book got remastered, there was a there was a, a time where you had said, Hey wow, this doesn't look like garbage like I thought it did. You know, that that there was actual quality to it. It just, you know, it was poorly reprinted. Uh, yeah, there's, there, um, I, I, I had that experience as well doing the, um, the, the Wolver Roach triptych where, um, okay, I don't, I don't draw like this and I wouldn't want to draw like this anymore. But once I had, uh, the first two covers done and side by side, it's like, uh, give, give the kid his brownie points. It's like his, his marriage was falling apart and, and he did these two covers and they are really, really, really grabby. They'll probably go for uh, a very good price because even though they're incompetent, um, as, as Neil Adams said when I talked to him about that, he said, uh, sometimes the more you learn, the more you lose the rock and roll quality. And, uh, yeah, I, I can I can definitely see you know a Ramones quality to it, but a lot of it is really really bad. It's uh, I, I, I'm trying I'm trying to I'm trying to meet the popular consensus halfway, and uh, uh, it's not coming over this way, and I can't really go all the way over that way. But yes, good point, good point. Well, and the other one that I was talking about, you know. Where did the quality drop off? It's like, well, in latter days, there was the scene of service and Kosenberg in the sanctuary with the Torah spread out. And, you know, it's it's the sanctuary. The background is, is it's dark. You can't see anything. But then at the, the Books of Service show, we saw the tracing paper of, okay, this is, this is Gerhard's background, the tracing paper. And we're like, everybody's jaw hit the floor. We're like, this is amazing. This, like, why would you put all this detail in here and just cover it up in black ink? And Gerhard's like, well, you know, at the time, I thought that we were going to see more of this, so I put every little noodle in there, and then, you know, when it came time to ink it, it was like, yep, nope, this is dark. You know, some of yeah. it's in the book, but, like, the tracing paper had detail on, on top of detail on top of detail, and it's like, you know, you know, and, there's, there, at the time, I was like, a book of just the tracing papers would probably sell like gangbusters when people open it up. They'd be like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. Uh, yeah, but gangbusters and gangbusters are, are two different things when you've been canceled. It's what? like, I have to figure out things that the 125 remaining uh, Cerebus sponsors are, are willing to pay a good buck for that I uh, you can only... You only need to print a uh, hundred of them. Yes, in, in a in a perfect world, um, Bards and Nobles would be on the edge of their seat, going, "We can't wait for the Gerhardt tracing paper book uh, for uh, Latter Days uh, to come out." It's like, uh, no, it's not Marxist feminist propaganda. Consequently, it's crap. Consequently, um, nobody nobody is interested, and it's like. Well, okay. Nobody's uh, nobody's been interested in my work since uh, since 1994 for that for that single reason. But enough people are interested in the work that I'm not going to try and swim uphill against uh, the the Marxist feminist dictatorship. You'd, you'd be crazy to try and do that. Uh, you know, let's let's solicit Diamond for the uh, the Gerhard latter days. Um, hardcover, you know, full size. Uh, 
you would have to explain to 99% of, uh, of the comic book stores what Latter Days even is. And it would be, oh, that's, uh, that's Dave Sim's religious crap. It's, uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I got put into a number of different boxes, and so did Gerhardt. And uh, none of them are very good boxes. <laughs> well, I mean, it'll sell like gangbusters. The problem is, is it's not Al Capone's gang; it's our gang, and you can bust them kids in like two minutes. <laughs> which is which is fine. You you adjust yourself to it. I mean, uh, we're we're sort of getting ahead of uh, um, uh, 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 of our story here because we start talking about that later on. So we'll 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 get away from that and then uh, and then continue talking about the uh, you know this is this is what you do if life life hands you you lemons you, you make lemonade if uh, you know the fan mail consists of one letter a week which uh, is up from its uh, previous average uh, back around you know. 2010, 2011, where it was uh, one letter a month. It's like, well, okay, do do the person a drawing, send them send them free comic books, whatever. It's like these people are actually interested in your work and have ignored uh, what the Marxist feminist dictatorship is is telling them that uh, no, if you want to read. Uh, service in high society and maybe part of church and state do that but uh, everything after that is crap and it's like well okay some people don't listen to that um, you know some people uh, make up their own mind about things and are rewarded and go I had no idea that this was my kind of thing but uh, um, Dave Sim and his work is uh, is my kind of thing 